Helsinki, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Jan, one of the co-founders of this event. Let's bring up the chair. Uh, do you guys have the video prompted? I hope we do. Um, so, before, Good morning, everyone. before we go into our keynote, we have a bet to settle that we uh, created a couple months ago. Uh, and there's some video footage for context for this audience. I'm awfully excited about what I get to do in a little bit. Uh, do they have the video? Because I'd love to play it. Yes, we have the video. Could you roll the Finland video? Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be good. All right. This is Jan and I in Sweden, and I was asking people how much it would cost to shave their head, and Jan said he, all he needed was a hundred dollars. So this is a uh, Babin, one of my video guys, and he's now running around trying to find <laughs> a razor. In theory. <laughs> in theory. In theory to cut people's. All right. All right. Thank so, you. Jan is... So what I respect about Jan is that he's a man of his word. We made a bet to shave his head for a hundred bucks. He said, "When you get to Helsinki, we will uh, we will take care of it." So I'm gonna pull out my hundred dollars. All right, so I'm removing my, my microphone. Well, it's not done yet, is well, it? Go ahead, here you go. All right. That's for you. Thank go ahead. You. Put that on. Thank you. It's a right. real hundred dollar bill. Not even a euro. Well, all right, I'm gonna excuse myself and you can... Yeah, I've never shaved get. a man's head before, so um, I hope this doesn't hurt you. Good? Go for it, go for it. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the first cut, then I'm gonna move you on over and give the keynote, because that's what you're here for, but are you ready? Yes. Let's clap it up for this gentleman. <laughs> Hello, D-Rock. It's actually fun. Let's just do a little more. Don't post it anywhere. <laughs> this is fucking awesome. <laughs> All right, that's good. Let's clap it up for him. You're a real sport. You look great. Great. Good morning. Um, so the format that we've set up here is I'm gonna give a 20 or 30 minute kind of 20 or so minute keynote and then we're gonna open up for about 20, 25 minutes of Q&A and so the thing that I really wanted to talk about uh, this morning was a couple of different pillars that I'm seeing in the marketplace that I think will help the individuals in this room and I think the word that I wanna focus on most of all this morning is practicality. I think when I think about the, the makeup of the individuals in this room, whether they come from a corporate environment, are in a startup, are an entrepreneur, two years into their business, 20 years into their business, I think the thing that really resonates with me is, especially at this point in the evolution of the internet, which is really what we're all kind of sitting here and talking about, um, 
there's a really interesting delta of the people in this audience, in this market of Helsinki, in Europe, the US, mainland China, the people that are clearly accelerating are the ones that understand the practicality of the moment, not where blockchain is going, not what television commercials used to do for them, but who's actually marketing and executing in a May, June 2018 world and taking advantage of where all of our collective attention is and what to do with it based on their business objectives today and within the short term. And so for me, the thing that's most interesting is that in a world where things like AI and AR and the emerging blockchains that I think are gonna be built in the next couple of years and in a world of voice, which I'm unbelievably passionate about and really I do think that the apps built on top of Alexa and Google Home, Apple Pod are no question going to have the same impact on our society the way that Waze or Spotify or Shopify or Instagram had as apps on top of the iPhone. In that whole world, to me that feels like 12, 24, 36, 48, 60 months from where it starts making an impact. To me, if I have any impact on this audience today, the places where I wanna go on are where I think you can have the biggest return on what you're trying to do. Regardless of what you're doing, whether you're developing an incredibly large project uh, that you're working on, whether you're selling sneakers, whether it's t-shirts or your services, whether you're a SaaS company, a media company, no matter what anybody does here, running for mayor, no matter what anybody does here, the currency is attention. The currency that we all strive for is attention. And then once you have the attention, the game that we all need to play is the ability to create words in written form, audio, video, or pictures to inspire an action that we're intrigued by. For me, that plays out very simply. When I look at the landscape today, this is the remote control and the platform of our attention. And when you look at the data of how much time is spent on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn on this device, social networks or content platforms that we now call social networks represent almost half the time humans spend on a cell phone. I think we can all agree that the amount of time we spend on a cell phone is staggering and continues to grow. For me, if you are not producing audio, written words, videos, and pictures for those seven to eight platforms today on a daily basis consistently, you are in the beginning process of complete irrelevance in our society. And for me, not having a complete religion around that is a grave, grave mistake. The other thing that becomes unbelievably interesting for me this morning at this keynote is the fact that in this market, Helsinki, Finland, and the Nordics as a whole, the two platforms that I obsess the most over today for scale, Facebook and Instagram, the ads, the influencer marketing market, and the organic reach are all dramatically more interesting in this market than they are in other parts of Europe, definitely than they are in the US and Canada and other parts of South America. If, if I could really get you to a very simple place this morning, the only thing you actually fundamentally have to understand is that Facebook ads, both in Instagram and Facebook form, in this market are so underpriced that even if you are average at the creative that you put behind those ads, you will get disproportionate return on your business, whether you're B2B or B2C. To me, that is a moment that I haven't seen since early Google. When I think about my career, when I launched an e-commerce wine business in 1996, I was able to build a business that was doing $3 million a year on 10% gross profit, so $300,000 before expenses. A business of that size with a $14,000 a year marketing budget in year one, I was able to build that business from a three to a $60 million business in five years, 100% on the back of email and Google AdWords. When I look back at that story, I have enormous amounts of regret 
because I genuinely believe that that should have been three to two hundred million dollars. The mistake I made in my youth, the mistake I made that many people made was I just didn't understand how good of a deal Google AdWords were from 2000 to 2004. They were so remarkably underpriced that I wasn't able to quantify, especially since I had no prior experience, that I was buying beachfront property, that I was digging up gold at enormously low prices. That underlining understanding in hindsight is what drives me this morning to suffocate anybody's excuses in this room to why Facebook, to why Instagram doesn't work or for the people here, actually watch this, how many people here have run Facebook ads and it didn't for say work as well as you wanted, which I'm sure is for a lot, raise your hands. Actually, raise them high, please, I wanna see this. So I think this is what's super important. There's an enormous percentage of people here who've already done what I'm spitting as the thing you need to be doing. But I wanna make sure that 20% of this room that just raised their hand understood that there are so many variables that go into something not being successful. Most of all, the biggest variable is you probably did not do a good job executing the campaign. At the end of the day, when you think about the ROI of something, the ROI of anything is always far greater for the people that are good at it versus bad at it. The ROI of a piano, for me, is zero. The ROI of a piano for Elton John is over a billion dollars. So to me, the concern I have is that we're sitting right now in this prime era where everybody in this room, and I mean everybody, government employees down to entrepreneurs selling a tie on the internet, all have unbelievable white space in this medium, and I believe that there's a gross misunderstanding, and I, I challenge and predict that everybody in this room that doesn't run a hefty amount of Facebook ads, Instagram ads, and Instagram influencer campaigns during this next 24 to 36 months will look back at this speech and this era with the same regret that I have through my body to what I did from 2001 to 2004, which is you may win and do quite well, but please, Don't misunderstand it. You've left an enormous opportunity on the table. Uh, You know, it's so funny in the US, I've been pontificating this for about three or four years, and by the way, just for those who are scoring at home, the cost of the CPM on Facebook has gone up substantially in the last 24 to 36 months globally and definitely in the US, yet still grossly less than it deserves. It's interesting, I, I, I pontificate this and big companies see, wow, really? let's clap it up, this is fucking clean. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Good. All right, thank you guys. I'll be back a little bit later. In the US, I have the biggest CEOs in the world arguing to me that this platform doesn't sell their product, that Facebook's not ROI positive. Meanwhile, in the other side of their mouth, they're complaining to me that it's bringing down the American democracy and things of that nature. I mean, you're talking about a platform that is so fundamentally powerful that the CEO of the company had to present in front of Congress over a two day period on its impact on the psychology of the end consumer. This is not, this is not a platform that everybody here should be underestimating. I would argue, including me, who is no question one of its biggest cheerleaders, everybody, everybody at this conference is underestimating it. So. First and foremost, very simply, in a very practical way, taking a step back and understanding what's happening for real on Facebook, for real, in both its media capabilities and its creative capabilities is something I implore everybody here to do. As far as practicality, the other thing that I wanna really talk about is how remarkable this era actually is. In a, in a macro, we are living through what is now a 20, 25 year invention in our society. As much as we underestimate Facebook, I believe that we underestimate the internet as a whole dramatically more. Everything is being played out on top of this platform. And for me, 
for, how many people here are entrepreneurs or startups? Raise your hands. Amazing. So for me, one of the biggest things that I want to talk about is the ecosystem at this moment around this platform, meaning it's never been more practical to actually make money in a world where, one more time, hands, VC, you know, startups, entrepreneurs, in a world where all of us over the last decade have been pushed enormous propaganda around raising money and me watching as, you know, I made my first investment in 2007 my first three investments were Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. And as you can imagine, that worked out tremendously well for me. But it's interesting to see what's happened in the 11 years since. I invested in Tumblr after it had tens of millions of users in its B round at a $14 million valuation. Now, based on a lot of your reactions to that statement, as you know, in your idea phase as a seed, in the US, companies are able to get four to $10 million valuation. The insanity and borderline fraud that is going on with ICOs in the crypto world. I mean, this is just a completely non-practical 10 years of global economic growth, broken landscape that absolutely has nothing grounded in practicality. I wanna remind everybody in this room when you're building a startup, you're building a business, not a financial arbitrage machine that has to hit web economic data points to raise your next round based on users and all this other horseshit that VC propaganda has pumped into the system for their selfish points of view and what they're doing, and by the way, I'm a capitalist, like I love all the VCs, I am a VC, but I need the founders and startups in here to understand their business model because their advice is predicated on what they need to be doing for themselves and their shareholders, not for what they should be doing for you and more importantly, the VC landscape is littered with, at its best, has-beens and people that have never done it and the advice lacks the practicality of the current landscape. And so I, I, I hope everybody heard me very clearly and when you reread the transcript, I have no problem with people that are deploying capital. As somebody who's on the other end of emails like the one I got the other day, when somebody who lost $300,000 of my hard earned money said it was no big deal and he was glad that he learned and I was like, that's nice that you learned, fuckface, but you lost my money. There are both sides of this ecosystem that are at fault. Both founders and VCs right now lack practicality in a 2018 world because the world is too flush with money and many of you in here are not actually building businesses. You're building a house of cards that falls the second there's any economic slowdown or any algorithm change by one of the platforms that you're actually building your company on top of. So again, and, and very much my hope this morning where the Q&A goes as I try to navigate through Jan's hair, um, I, I hope that what I can put in the ground is what has serviced me super well for the last 20 years and will for the next 30 years, which is are you grounded in practicality? Do you actually live and navigate in the year that you actually live in? Are you factoring in enormous economic prosperity for a decade and when does that go away? Are you factoring in that you're building your business on top of somebody else? One of my favorite things that's going on right now, back to building on top of somebody else is how many people complain. How many people six or 12 months ago started seeing their friends or startups complain about Instagram or Facebook's algorithm change? And I would sit there and I would laugh as people would cry about this and I would remind them and I remind you Helsinki this morning, those platforms are free. The platforms are free. All the people that are complaining that they're not getting as many likes or engagement or the organic reach went down need to be reminded 
that you built your content on these platforms, you built something on the free attention that these platforms had, you selfishly took that attention for your interest, and then when it started to decline at the cost of free, you got fucking pissed. That makes no sense practically. And so, if you're building your business on top of another company, and you're getting the benefits of it for free, take the goods while the goods are being given, take that data and then make it your own, build your first party ecosystem around that, and then move on your merry way, but definitely don't be at the reliance of the platform. There are many people here who will continue to navigate off that free and then be caught, and I just am struggling And actually, that's a good way to set this up. I'm struggling with the lack of practicality and naivete in our ecosystem about what's gonna happen. My favorite day recently in the tech world was when Amazon in America bought Whole Foods, a large food retailer. Everybody was stunned, like shocked, like, All the big CPG companies, the Coca-Colas, the Pepsis, the Quakers, the Campbell Soups of the world, all of a sudden, who were poo-pooing Amazon for only representing 1% of their business, now had a new problem because they owned one of the most important retailers. And I read all the comments and I read all my emails and I just watched the world, in that world, react to it. And I was taken aback by people's naivete as if, We don't understand what's happening here. Guys, do you understand that Apple can buy every company that you think is awesome multiple times over? I don't think people understand what the Alibabas and the Tencents and the Amazons and the Apples and the Googles and the Facebooks are about to do. They're gonna buy the full stack. When when you wake up and you see that, you know, Alibaba bought Tesco or when Facebook buys Target Like, this is where it's going. And so again, the framework that I'm trying to create this morning is one very simple thing, which is, this has just started. The internet's the middleman. The internet's the middleman. And there's seven to 10 companies in the world, globally, who've been able to build the layer directly on top of the internet. They've won. Our jobs all here is to be the next layer after that. The people in this room that understand how to navigate Amazon and Apple and Google and Tencent and Facebook best in a world where you extract the value from it before it extracts the value from you will be the individuals that are most successful. And so the reason I'm building this framework is knowing that I'm gonna have a lot of time with Q&A and when we get to Q&A, please ask me any basic very needle in the haystack question, that's what I'm here for. But what I'm trying to do this morning is get everybody's mindset into what's actually happening here. And what's actually happening here is that Uber and Amazon and Airbnb, they're the preview, they're not the anomaly. Every industry that every one of us are in is on call and the internet is lurking. And somebody and something is going to attack where we're doing our thing. And so that leads me to the place that matters to me the most. In a world where you're like, okay, if you believe what I'm saying, if it makes sense to you, the question becomes, now what? And the now what of all of this gets to a very interesting place, which is the following. The number one thing that I would implore everybody to be thinking about in this room is your brand. The reason your brand matters so much is it's the most ownable asset. It's also the thing that will protect you the most over the next 20, 30 years. Let me explain. One of my biggest theses at this point right now is that voice is going to be a fundamentally game-changing technology for all of us because we all value time over almost everything else besides our health. Everybody here that now takes out their phone to do many actions will be doing it directly from their lips to not a device like an Alexa pod or things of that nature, but to the integration of speakers in our everyday life. For example, 
all of you that are wearing clothes today, whether it's a tie or a shirt, it's a very highly likely world where there'll be voice activated capabilities in those products or in your ear or your ear pods or wherever it may go. The friction between you saying something like there's information you want or a transaction that you want to create and the ability for that to happen is going to be almost zero. When that happens, there are many things that are in trouble. First of all, at foremost, the reason Google has to win this game is that Google text search is in deep shit. The days of you going to your phone and typing in a search query a decade from today are going to be over because it's gonna take you longer than saying who was the president in 1967? How many miles before this? Is my restaurant open? And I'm sure, how many of you saw the Google Assistant demo a couple weeks ago? Just raise your hands. Some crazy fucking shit. And that's today's technology. Where do you think that's going? So in a world of voice that I think is gonna eat up buying decisions, are you in a place where when I say, Alexa, get me a black car, or Alexa, get me an Uber, that becomes a very interesting conversation. In a world where we know Kleenex or Xerox or things of that nature, they've won this game. If you tell Alexa to send you a pair of jeans, Amazon is gonna have the leverage. They're either gonna send you a private label, or they're gonna make a brand pay through the nose to be the default jeans to all of our language. The number one thing that will protect your business over the next decade is building a brand around your business. Building a brand that transcends all the advancements that we're about to make in technology that eliminate friction from the decision making process. We've gone from the yellow pages or any directory that you had in this country to Google and next it's gonna play out in voice and I wouldn't bet against Amazon, and when you think about Amazon as a retailer, that becomes unbelievably dangerous. One could be sitting here and say, fine Gary, but I'm not in the consumer space, I'm in the B2B space, which is great, but I promise you, the way that many will pick their lawyer, pick their contractor, their IT developer, will be the same way they do today, which is through utility-based search or word of mouth. Both, which will play out in voice, both, that will require everybody here to create brand. And so where am I going with this? Here's where I'm going. There are way too many people in this room that are over-reliant on math. They are in the sales business, not the marketing business. The way they succeed is through the digital age of transactions and they look at things like CAC and LTV and quant-based metrics. And that's great and incredible to get you to a point but the point of my existence in the marketing landscape and where I see all the opportunity going forward has far more to do about brand. There are very few people here that are thinking about how to spend five to $25,000 to make a video that's two to three minutes long that tells the story emotionally about what they're doing and then thinking about how to distribute that content in a Facebook and Instagram world for another $20,000. The amount of people here who are willing to roll the dice on $50,000 on a video on Facebook to make their world work is quite low. It's high risk, it's not as measurable, and it's something that most people aren't investing in. At the same token, I personally believe that's exactly what people need to be investing in right now because at the end of this war, which is what it is. Don't get confused of what Apple and Facebook and Google and Tencent and Alibaba, this war where you're gonna see more walls put up, not sharing data, that's where all the money is. This war, what's going to happen is our worlds are gonna become unbelievably frictionless and we're gonna be doing things that are completely predicated on brand. The number one way for you to get ready for that, because I'm not interested in telling you what's gonna happen in seven or nine or 13 years, because that is totally not practical. The quickest way for you to understand that world is for you to right now become a practitioner of Facebook advertising 
and Instagram advertising in this market or any market that you're marketing in outside of mainland China and Russia. You have to, have to become a practitioner of influencer marketing, of Facebook media spend, of creative in these platforms. The outsourcing and relying on others in social media marketing is the mass vulnerability of this collective room. Being a headline reader versus a practitioner is the thing that I'm most worried about in this room. Do you know how many people in this room have opinions about Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and their ad product and their capabilities to move their business without ever running an ad on the platform? My friends, it's almost 2019. Like, the days of putting your head in the ground and hoping this isn't happening or having a very basic point of view on these platforms is coming to an end. You've been able to get away with kind of knowing about the capabilities. I do not believe that we have the luxury of that. And because of that, and then we'll go into Q&A, Jan, I see you hovering. Because of that, for the 30% of people that raised their hand earlier of being entrepreneurs or startups, because of that, this is the greatest era to be an entrepreneur or startup ever. Because the rules are so extreme that the incumbents, people that have been successful, don't have the leverage that they have historically had because the infrastructure costs were deployed against a world that doesn't exist anymore. You have to understand that. The advantages that Bruce and I and others that have been able to succeed in, those values are not as valuable as they were if we were navigating 50 years ago because the property we owned or the media that we owned, it was more valuable. The speed in which your attention is moving and to where is remarkable and the reason you're seeing such incredible change politically at a geo level and emotionally and the issues that we're facing as humans and talking about whether it's racism or sexism or nationalism is happening strictly because of this. Because as a boy that was born in the Soviet Union I'm unbelievably aware of what propaganda and media do. We're all becoming a hell of a lot more aware of it. The fact that you have fundamental control at incredibly low cost to do that for your selfish business ambitions with all good intentions, it's nice to build a business, it's great. The fact that you can do it too and you're not taking full advantage of it is the great miss of your life. Thank you. All right, all right. So it's time for Q and A. Okay. Yes. And for this year, we, we're going to start Help a little me. bit special. We're Obi-Wan not going to go straight. Kenobi. We're not going to go straight to audience. We actually have people from I don't know future, past and we're going to have them appear on the screen and they're going to ask the question. So, can we get the first question, please? Let's see what's going to happen. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. (laughs) You are my only hope. (gasps) Excuse me, sir. I was traveling across the galaxies to find the one. Can you help me? Yes. Oh, we that's can. me? Yeah. Got it, shit. Sorry. Yes, I can. R2D2, bring me back. <laughs> oh, she's gone. <laughs> I love it. All right. That was a quick one. Do we have another question and not Star Wars interruptions? Oh, hi there. My name is Alexi Hapeoki, and I'm here to ask you a question, Gary. So my question for you is, what is the next thing that marketers will ruin? Thank you. You're welcome. So I often talk about marketers ruin everything, right? You know, my career is trying to figure out where you're spending your time organically, and then I'm trying to figure out how to penetrate it and sell shit. You know, and so I think the thing that 
you know, it's, there's nothing that's very black and white to me, but if you look at email, the reason we've all protected our text messages so much is we gave up our email and marketers ruined it, right? I think that the next thing will clearly be voice, mm-hmm. but I think what we've learned from Facebook, is the great misunderstanding of Facebook's era is that the algorithm changes because the only asset Facebook has is your attention, and as soon as they see that they're putting too much ads or things that you don't want, they start eliminating it to keep you there. I think that has changed my historic point of view on marketers ruin everything. I think everybody here is starting to intuitively understand that through marketing, we need to bring more value. It's less about interrupting and being selfish, and it's more about being, bringing value. But to answer it directly, I think the voice space is gonna be the big battleground where we'll get a lot of value, and then marketers will come in and try to figure out how to get our attention and buy shit. It's like you're gonna ask, oh. Ask Alexa or something first, gonna give you an ad before he gives you the answer. I don't know if, I don't think Amazon's gonna give us an ad. I don't Mm. think when Bruce says, hey, I want some toilet paper or toothpaste, that Amazon's right move is saying, Bruce, you know, you should try the new Crest. Nobody's gonna want that. I think where Amazon has unbelievable leverage is when he says, I want three tubes of toothpaste, they're gonna just send whatever the fuck they want. (laughs) Because I think the thing that you'll be stunned by is there's very few things that you actually very much care about to stay on the same brand. And everybody's different. Somebody in the audience here may only use this one shampoo, others won't. I, is this the pair? Yeah, so I can't believe that I bought three pairs of jeans on Amazon without saying the brand. I thought I cared about the brands of jeans that I wore, but in the moment, as my behavior's changing, I was taught by myself that it's not a category where I care. Versus cereal, I would never say to Google, Google send me some cereal. I'm gonna say send me fucking Captain Crunch. <laughs> so I think, I think it's gonna be interesting to see where it goes, but I don't think it's gonna be an ad. Okay. I think it's gonna be the leverage of sending whatever you want. That blue bar at the top of Google is not gonna be a suggestion anymore. It's where you're gonna go. And as you can imagine, that's going to be very expensive. All right, thank you. Next question, please. Hi, Gary. Nice to meet you. My name is Benoit. I'm from France. I uh, live and work here in Finland uh, for a project called Marco, a club for foodie. Very glad to meet you. I have a question for you, Gary. I was wondering, uh, do you believe in teleportation? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, the reality is, is that I like to talk about shit that I know. I have no knowledge or expertise in teleportation. So the answer is no, my friend. But I like your shirt. <laughs> okay, thank you for the answer. Oh, again. wow. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Okay, bye bye, Benoit. Are you somewhere here? Oh, over here. You wore the same shirt? <laughs> Did it today, love that. One more here, are we going to the audience? We have a couple more, I think. Okay. Hi, Gary. Hi, Arctic 15. My name is Matthew Mineta. I'm an entrepreneur living up here in the Nordics from the States, and I have a question for you. So, what are the three main points you look for in a project before you'll devote time and money into it? So this has been an interesting transition. Thanks for the question. Um, My biggest, so early on I wasn't an investor. I invested in those three very successful companies. Then I started getting high on my own supply and thought I was special because of those three bets and I became an investor. In hindsight, the very obvious mistake I made is I've had a good entrepreneurial career. I'm an operator. I'm probably even more a COO than I am a CEO if you really look under the hood of how I navigate. So the biggest mistake that I made was I would look at a business and I believed in the thesis and I would invest in it because I knew what I would do. 
But what I didn't take into account was that the entrepreneur or the CEO, that she or he wasn't capable of doing what I would do. So in today's world, and I invest very rarely because I think everything's overvalued and I'm just kind of waiting for the next cycle, but once in a while, uh, Robin Shapiro walked into my office. She blew me away with her concept on cricket protein, right? So I uh, did some homework on it. She was unbelievably passionate. I believed in the thesis that cricket as a protein, as a food source, has a lot of upside. Then I spent a lot of time asking myself, do I believe she was in it for the long haul and could she move the company into a totally different space if it didn't work out? I am now at the point, to answer the question directly, 51% of my energy is based on do I believe in her or him to be able to win, the jockey, Mm -hmm. 49% on the horse, then away I go. I have to fall in love with the person. I'd prefer at this point to mitigate my risk, so I'd love to invest in somebody who has done it before, so I can look under the hood of how they did it. Mm -hmm. And then I, of course, have to believe in the thesis. Like, uh, you know, no question, I can already feel, and you can see from the talk this morning, that the apps that are gonna be built on top of Alexa and Google Home is gonna be a place where I do a lot of investing. And so um, the jockey and the horse, only those two variables. Okay. I'm not worried about could Google copy this or Facebook beat this. Competition doesn't factor in at all. I definitely don't wanna see your bullshit math metrics of in three years we'll be doing 28 million. It's straight black magic bullshit. Bullshit, bullshit. Like fucking bullshit. <laughs> Sorry. I mean just like, it's bullshit. such bullshit. Like business school, dynamics in a 30 page deck based on the reality of business is like fucking outer space, it's like teleportation. Um, so, the jockey and the horse. Okay, good. Oh, Matt's still there. All right. Hi, Gary. Oop. Hi, Arctic 15. Next My name is one. Matthew Mineta. I'm an entrepreneur living up here in the Nordics. I know, Matthew, States. you already asked your question, Dick, question get off the stage. You. Next one, so, please. What are the three it's main points technology. you look for I get it. in a project yeah. before you'll devote time and money into it? All right, Matthew, so what I look for is the, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can we go into the audience? I you think we have like that? one or two more good, good ones coming. Okay. Yep. Hello Gary, I am Romain from Estonia, but I lived all over the world and I have a question for you. Is there any business area that you would never invest into? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't think it's a good idea. I, I'm not, you know, this is where it's a little tough. I don't know if he means geographically or in genres of business. A genre. Genres? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't invest in things that I think were passed by. So I would never invest in search engines that are print and you know, written based, based on what I just said. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to invest in retail companies that have too much of their capital tied up in their locations in a world where e-commerce is, no question, generating disruption. I mean, th the actual answer to this question as I'm going through my mind is actually a ton of shit. I think in a world that we're living in right now where technology is sweeping our lives, it makes so many areas vulnerable. So to me, I probably spend a lot of time eliminating things and I think there's, pro there's probably way, way, way more things I wouldn't invest in anymore. I mean, I wouldn't invest in a social network now. It's just so hard to penetrate in a world where Facebook and the incumbents, I think we all saw what happened with Snapchat. Enormous growth, in essence, ended up being a feature and and now has to innovate to, to succeed. So my answer is most things I wouldn't invest in because I think they're getting disrupted too aggressively. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Romain. Thank you, Gary, that was a good answer. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Way to guess, Romain. Oh. There we go. Oh, hello. How's everybody doing? I was reading this amazing book by you know who, and I had one question for you guys. Actually, this one goes to Jan. Jan, how's your hair? <laughs> oh, it's really? pretty awesome. <laughs> <Whoop>. <laughs> 
nice work, Jan. Thank, Thank you. you. I think you have one more left from the future or the past. Let's see. Yeah. Hi, Gary. My name is Jonathan Hershon, and this blur that you see across my face is actually deliberate. There's no technical problem here. It's just that I'm kind of famous for the fact that there are no pictures of me on the internet, and I would very much like to keep it that way. That's cool. It's so my question for you is this. Uh, we're both from Silicon Valley, and we're both here in the Nordics, and I've been involved in uh, public relations for 20 years in the tech scene, and I've been working with a lot of different Nordic companies over the years, and I'm actually very surprised that more people in Silicon Valley don't know about the Nordic tech evolution and the fact that we actually have great technology up here. So my question to you is this. Why do you think more people in Silicon Valley don't invest in Nordic companies and how can that be changed? Thank you, my friend. Uh, I think America has an enormous America bias. I think Silicon Valley entrepreneurs live in a bubble. Um, America is unbelievably not global. It's quite insulary. And I think that there's friction in location and cultures that they don't think they need to deal with uh, because there's an abundance of opportunity within the US in the same way that I think you'll watch over the next 100 years China do very much the same. The market's so big, there's no reason to address other markets. And so I think that's the reason. And, and that's why I really get upset about the VC pedestal Silicon Valley thing because there's so many great entrepreneurs here whose biggest dream is to get funded in Silicon Valley and win that game where I feel like that's pandering to something that is not as practical as all the opportunity there is to actually just build a viable business in your market or your region. So to answer your question, my friend, I just think it's a US bias and the US Silicon Valley investment ecosystem has more than enough opportunities within it where they can fly to Chicago and New York or drive down the street versus having their company seven hours away. Okay, Jonathan's actually right here. Hey. <laughs> That's a great answer. Thank you very much for your time. Very appreciated. All right, that wraps up our hologram stuff. So now, does anybody here have any question to Gary? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Hello. How are you? Good. I, I've, uh, I've been listening to your podcast for the last couple of years, so huge fan. Thank you. Uh, my name is Taylor. I'm from a company called Valuer. Valuer AI, we connect startups with corporations. My question's kind of twofold. So you've talked about these unicorns that are looking into buying up these other larger companies and other markets and basically yes. this unilateral yes. takeover. Yes. How do you encourage Fortune 500 companies to start figuring out they need to start shelling out money now to not be left behind? The problem is I yell at them every day they don't want to do the capital expenditure because it hurts them in a 90-day window on Wall Street and they are actually very aware that often their culture is not a good body for the organ on the outside that they bring in. So I think, you know, when everybody wakes up in three years and realizes that Unilever paid a billion dollars for Dollar Shave Club and it failed, it's gonna make Pepsi and Procter and & Gamble and Kellogg's nervous. On the flip side, you know, just back to your question, just so you know, Fortune 500s right now are unbelievably aggressive on the M&A front. To, uh, there's so much underlining M&A going on right now. Like, they've been convinced. Like, the way you asked your question, it's happening. You're gonna see an enormous amount of M&A right now from the haves and the have-nots in the digital world. The problem is 95% are gonna fail because what they do you have to understand, you have to follow the money. In the same way that I was like ranting a little bit about VCs, that's Wall Street. You've got the biggest companies in the world doing everything in their power to make profit in every 90 days because the CEO, she and he's bonus and stock equity is tied to it. Nobody's building businesses, everybody's pandering to fucking numbers. Got it? Yeah, second parter, how do you tell the startups, hey, don't worry about getting absorbed, this is good for you, as opposed to, hey, I don't want to do business with you know, the big man on the block or something. 
That's a good question. I mean, I think too many startups, that's ego and audacity, right? Startups think they have this clever IP that if they do a deal with Dell or Pepsi, I usually remind startups that they're not as good as they think they are. I love when startups tell me like, Gary, you don't get it. We developed something that fucking Facebook doesn't get. And I take a step back, I'm like, real quick, just let me understand this right. You and two developers over the last nine months created some technology that Facebook and Google and Apple don't get, get the fuck out of here. And so I think that there is way too much ego in the startup community around this special IP they have and they're, they're not doing it out of, they, it looks like they're doing it out, not doing it out of fear, they're not doing it out of ego. Thank you, Gary. What's up? Victor How? from Slovakia. How are you, Victor? I'm um, great. How about you? Very good. Nice. Uh, first of all, thank, thank for your content, inspiring our community in Slovakia. So the question is, imagine you are no name, you are just starting. Would you rather focus on one project or you try to be involved on two, three at the same time? Thank you. The answer, brother, is both will work, right? I mean, the reality is, is there's no right answer. It depends on the skill in here. For me, in my youth, I focused on one project. It was a family business, it worked, I learned a lot of things, great. But, as you probably know, consuming my content, some of the biggest things I'm pushing right now is be very aggressive in your 20s and try a lot of things. Some people are naturally self-aware and have a very clear vision. Others are still trying to figure it out. I think the answer for the, if I can bring value to the most people here, is if you have 100% conviction and you know exactly what you're passionate about and what you're good about, well then go. But if you have any doubt, early on, this is where you could take the most risk, right? What most humans do is start making money and then start creating debt or overhead that puts them into a box. The, be- the beauty of being in your 20s is you don't have money or stuff often and so that allows you the freedom to try shit and during an era like this, trying shit around AI or AR or crypto, blockchain, is a great thing because you may stumble on your passion and what you're good at. So both can work. It comes down to the individual. And let me give you one other piece of advice if you're saying to yourself, fuck, then what do I do? You're never gonna know the alternative. If you go in all in on a project, you're never gonna be able to figure out if you tried other things. So this is more about being optimistic or pessimistic as a human being. You know, if in 10 years, if you didn't try something else, even if you're successful and you're a pessimist, you're gonna make up in your own mind that if you did something else, it would have been better. So I think this is about making a decision and not dwelling or pondering on what if, because what ifs cripple people. All right, we have time for one more, and then we have one more thing after that. Samsa, if you're here, come near, near the stage. Hi, Gary. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thrilled. I'm a huge fan. Thank um, you. You're actually the voice of my bedside story, so <laughs> thanks Thank for you. the podcast. I've been listening for a couple of years, and we actually started with my team a podcast to start with to learn and build a community. So uh, awesome. now we have about 300,000 listeners. Wow. wow, congratulations. So, thank you in Finland, more than you. it's quite nice. <laughs> Not more than me, but fuck, that's a lot. <laughs> thank you. Um, so now we're building, what we learned is that we started with um, on a female and sexuality and talking about sex uh, in a humorous way and directly, and now we learned that we also need to include the guys. Understood. So <laughs> we are building up. And what, before you go any further, why have you learned you need to include the guys? Because well, you want a bigger audience or because you feel like there's things that are missing? Well, um, to make the everyday life of people in relationships better, right. we need to include I understand. both okay. parties. Go ahead. So um, we want to build this and we are building this digital foreplay with an AR twist app okay. called More and Better. It's for couples, Question, for people please. in relationship and and now we have this audience here in the podcast and how do we get it to, to our app? Very easily, you throw right hooks. Like you basically, I mean you listen to my podcast, right? Yeah, yeah. As you know, when I have things I care about, whether it's my sneaker, my book, my voice con, 
I will read my own ads in the beginning of my podcast before I go into my podcast. I think the most interesting thing that people struggle with when they figured out how to build an audience which is to bring value is to then get the gear to ask that audience for something. I would have you and whoever else is part of the show or whoever's in the show to read ads. Like before you start the podcast, you say, hey, we've got our new app and before you listen to the rest of this podcast, it would mean the world to us if you go download the app and then you just keep on fucking asking. Keep on fucking asking, thank you. You got All right. it. Thank you. Uh, we have run, run out of time for the questions part now, but when we have a really quick one startup pitch to you. Okay. So Samsa from Kieku, come on stage or pitch from the microphone. Let's do this. Hey Gary. Come on up, come on, come on. Watch out for Jan's hair. Yeah. yeah nice haircut. <laughs> hey Gary, thanks for the hey. chat. How are you? Good, good. Uh, yeah, I appreciate you being very vocal about the voice coming up and uh, I share the passion. I'm building a voice community and basically my, what I'm thinking here is that uh, there's, uh, there are kind of two things in the voice. There's the complexities of finding good stuff to listen, so yes. the, uh, you know, that's all, all over the place. Then there's the length of the content yes. that makes it difficult to consume on the go and then there's the sort of one directionality of it. There's no sort of conversational dialogue. So that's what we are trying to solve. Build a dialogue between people. We call that minicast. So what I'm wondering is that, do you see that there's space for bi-directional com- conversational service around the voice? And if so, um, shall we partner or shall we compete? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think that's, so I wanna, let's keep going here because I wanna make sure I fully understand. You want to build a platform that allows Jan and I to communicate through voice devices? Um, basically, it's, uh, you can think of it as an Instagram of voice or Twitter of voice. You can do your minicast, which is a short, short voice commentary on your phone. Others can reply and comment. My, my, and AI helps to yep. build sort of conversation my, threads. My belief is that that's going to be more friction than you realize. Meaning, there's a reason that we text each other. Yep and don't send each other voice memos back and forth because it's faster to text. I think when we communicate with an AI voice device that replies in real time, that's more of a utility or could be entertainment. I think when it comes to -to peer-to-peer communication, text is faster than voice, which is why we're doing less phone calls and why we don't do voice memos. So if you asked me, that wouldn't be the place that I would first go to because if you think of Voxer, if you think of other things, there's been other things. You can layer AI on top of it. I'm not so sold that that's the consumer behavior that is obvious to me yet. Now, what may happen is as we get sucked into engaging with voice devices in an everyday life, we may migrate because we use it this way with a device to the way we talk with each other to more voice, but I feel like that is a secondary behavior built on the back of us interacting with AI devices, not the primary thing that we're gonna start with, which would then make me believe that what you're positioning is seven to 10 years away, if it even happens, more so than the thing that I would believe happens next. One man's point of view. Very quick follow up. Yes. So my point is that when we do podcasts today, yes. they are studio productions. What I claim is tech is ready that you can do that from your phone. Have, so you, that seen, we can... have you seen Anchor? Sure. So I think they're the ones who are claiming or at least are early in the US market to be doing that and it's, I'm watching it very careful. I'm not an investor advisor, I know them, but not really all that well, but I like them. Uh, I do think there's something to that. I, I see a lot of my fans, when I bring it up, start their podcasts on this, and I do think there's a space for that for sure. Yeah, All right. exactly, that's yeah. what I believe as well. Understood. Yeah. All right, awesome. thank you nice so much. All right, everybody, let's take a quick group selfie to wrap this thing up. <laughs> Can you a little bit warm it up and get up and cheer for us, yes? Oh, shit. How's the hair?
All right. Thank you. House Thinky, thank you for having me. Thank you. If you want Gary to ever come back to Helsinki, clap a little bit louder, please. Woo!